Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Ross Clement and um, I'm here to talk about my trip to Iraqi Kurdistan, which I did in late December 2019, so quite recent and I'm quite pleased that I got it in before these things became impossible again. Um, mm. I was there between, I think, well I left on the 15th of December, but I didn't get to Kurdistan until the morning of the 17th. The uh, morning of the 16th, my dates are slightly wrong, but it's something like that. And then I left on the morning of the 24th to get back in time for Christmas. So I have some slides, so I'll bring up my slides, start my slide share, switch back to Zoom. Come on, Zoom. <laughs> and Zoom has not given me my normal window. <laughs> there we go. I then share screen. I select the screen with the slides, share. And you should now see my slides. Yes. 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 Okay, good. Okay. So I'd say it's an actually quite uneventful trip to Iraqi Kurdistan. One reason I like to say that is because a lot of people told me all the things that were likely to happen to me if I did go. And I did my research and I decided that it was a very good place to go to. So I, I went, as it were. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about Kurdistan. Uh, my slides are taking a little bit of time to go from one to the other. There we go. This is actually the area of Greater Kurdistan, which of course is spread over four countries, Turkey, Syria, Iraq and I Iraq. Must say. And it's said that Kurdistan, uh, the Kurdish people are the largest group of people in the world who don't have their own country. And uh -huh. if you go back into the history, it's more or less, shall we say, a little bit of um, other people from other parts of the world writing lines on maps, which didn't really match the reality on the ground. And now this is a very difficult situation for the Kurdish people because, of course, they're a minority in each of these countries and it, it causes a lot of issues. Um, it's not really meant to be a political talk, so I won't go over it too much, but certainly one thing I found was it was very good to be aware of the shape of Kurdistan because that shape turns up a lot, okay? And it's, it's a very, very... The Kurdish people have a very, very strong national identity, even though they're spread over these countries and they're well aware of Kurdistan as a thing and it's a question I was often asked for example while I was there you know discussing why Kurdistan wasn't an independent country in which case I had to sort of apologize for uh, you were coming. sorry okay can people hear me yeah, yeah. yeah. okay good so this is actually the Kurdish region of Iraq and we get yes. some yellow bits and some yes. green bits uh, which uh, I think someone needs their microphone muted, maybe. Um, we've got some yellow bits, which actually are the bits which are unambiguously Iraqi Kurdistan. And the green bits are disputed areas where it's disputed between Kurdistan and Iraq as to which of these parts should be Kurdistan and which shouldn't be. And in effect, after the referendum, some parts of what were previously Kurdistan were taken over by the central Iraq uh, government. And those parts I couldn't actually go to because of my visa. I only had a visa for the Tur uh, Kurdish region, which I got just by turning up at the border and asking for it. And so therefore I was a little bit limited into where I could go and where I couldn't go. But looking at that map, I'm pretty sure that I went slightly outside those boundaries on that map. Okay, why did I go to Kurdistan? One reason was is that um, I think in my bio it mentions I was a foreign student in Japan, which I found a fascinating cultural experience. I got an opportunity to learn a foreign language and lots of other good things happened. And I think it's looking back at it from a long time in the future because I went to Japan when I was in my 20s and I'm clearly no longer anywhere near my 20s. Um, I found that travel was getting a little bit samey. And even though I think I don't want to run down European capital cities, I had seen an awful lot of them and they started looking a bit samey. So I wanted something which was an interesting cultural experience. And in December 2018, I seem to go in December a lot, I went and visited Iran and had a fascinating experience and met lots of interesting people, uh, many of whom a lot of these people on these slides I'm still in contact with. So that was very, very good. In that trip, I was actually meant to spend just a couple of days in Slimani in Kurdistan by taking a plane over and then taking a plane back to Tehran. But when I actually, slightly perhaps too late, went to book my flights, I booked the flights to Iran and then found that the plane to Kurdistan had sold out. And I did a lot of research and I found that trying to fix the journey wasn't going to work and it was actually both easier and cheaper actually 
to simply say, well, I'll fly all the way from England to Kurdistan in a future time and then do Kurdistan properly then, which I think in hindsight was a good thing to do because I got to spend a lot more time in Kurdistan and I got to actually go to different areas in Kurdistan that I wouldn't have otherwise have gone to. And I went there in the light of my experience of Iran. But I do recommend Iran as well as a fascinating place to visit, although with the current situation, it's slightly more difficult than it was. So to get there, um, I was actually inspired by Deb's talk last week about, and uh, Andrew's talk as well, about uh, doing things overland. So I didn't do this one overland, uh, but let's wait till we get one of the last slides of the talk. So I'm in, of course, Leicester, and I need to get all the way down there. And the place where I entered was Duhok, which is about where that red thing is. So my first trip was actually two flights. I took a flight from London to Istanbul. And from there, my original plan was to do the rest overland, but a Turkish friend of mine advised me not to. So I did take another flight from Istanbul to Mardin in effectively Turkish Kurdistan. And from Mardin, I then took a coach. So the next slide shows my journey. Now, when I go on Google Maps and say I'm going to go from Mardin to Duhok, it actually shows you going for several hundred kilometers, more or less along the Syrian border. I did actually think, well, probably it won't do that. It'll probably go through Midiat or somewhere like that. And I did some research and someone said, well, their coach took them to the Syrian border. I did get a little bit nervous about that. And I will apologize to people um, for being a bit nervous, but I, I called the coach station in Mardin, which I got to from the airport very quickly. Uh, I eventually found some, I found someone online and he recommended his friend who was a taxi driver. His taxi driver came and picked me up, of course, for I paid for it, of course, and uh, drove me to the coach station. And I called it on Facebook, the coach station of slight nervousness. You know, I was sort of thinking that oh, I put myself in a situation here, I've got to go through with it now. And I, with, uh, with other things I've also had, it's a part of my nature, I think, that I sometimes have slight last thoughts. Have I really done the right thing? <laughs> but I got on the coach. And I turned my uh, Google Maps on and my location on, and I looked to see where the coach was going, and it was going to terminally south. So it went straight for the border, and then we drove along the border quite a lot. So I have actually seen uh, Syria, because I've seen Syria out of my coach window. It was actually <laughs> at night, but there were some places where I was going very, very closely along the border, or the road basically was the border, and I could see lit up towns out of my right-hand side coach window, and those would have been in Syria. We got there to Sizrea, I may pronounce it wrong, and there we actually changed a lot. And basically everybody got off the coach except for a few people, a few people got on, and there are six of us who took the coach then to the border crossing. Now, some of the photographs in this talk are not mine, and I've got a big list of slides and uh, credits at the end for the photographs that aren't mine. This is Ibrahim Khalil border crossing, which is the standard way into Kurdistan if you come overland because fundamentally there aren't any other border crossings. Uh, online, there's a place where someone's got a picture of a new border crossing being built, but I checked it before I booked all my tickets and everything, and it still just looks like a big pile of dirt beside a road, and that's eventually going to be a border crossing. This is of during daytime, and I actually turned up at midnight. So at midnight, it was not very crowded. Uh, we didn't have to wait in queues for anything like that. And um, it's it was already sort of uh, emphasizing the sort of the how to put it, the friendly nature of the place that everybody was talking to me and a lot of people seemed interested in me and I was therefore I was going into Kurdistan. <laughs> so I went there and I got my passport stamped and I mentioned that Iran it's quite expensive to get the, the visa but once you got the visa the travel insurance when I went last year or 2018 was quite cheap but to go to Iraq the visa is actually completely free but please do not ask me how much the travel insurance cost because it cost a lot. <laughs> so we went through there and again basically just got my passport stamped and went straight in. I did actually read online as someone who had a different experience. They went very soon after the referendum and at that point the Iraqi, the central Iraqi authorities had taken over the border crossing. So we turned up expecting to find Kurdish authorities and to get his um, passport stamped and straight in but he got uh, Iraqi border authorities who insisted he had a visa and he didn't have one. And he then had a very, very large argument, which I'm told included phrases such as, this is Iraq, nobody comes on holiday to Iraq, which if you look online is not true, but that's what he was told. But <laughs> after arguing a very long way, he managed to get through. But I got through quite easily, and my coach then dropped me off uh, outside Duhok City, as it turned out, at about two o'clock in the morning. 
And I then had to struggle to get to my hotel, which was quite a struggle and emphasized to me that I hadn't planned things properly. Uh, we did actually manage to get a shared taxi into town. Um, I'm not quite sure if I did the negotiation for the price right, but I paid 10 American dollars, which in hindsight was a reasonable amount. I don't know if it costs more at two o'clock in the morning. And then I got to my hotel. What I didn't know in the culture is that in hotels, there'll be somebody sleeping in the lobby and you've got to knock really, really hard on the door to wake them up to get in. And I didn't know that. And I sort of ended up wandering around because I knocked sort of politely on the door and I could see that it was all dark and there was nobody there. So I actually went around looking for a different hotel. I couldn't find any of them that were open. And wandering around by this time it had got to three o'clock in the morning, eventually somebody there uh, took pity on me and said, just, uh, he spoke English. He said, just jump in my car. I paid a full night, even though I got there at 3 a.m. Uh, Duhok is actually a very normal city. It's got a long history, it's practically everywhere in Iraqi Kurdistan. Has. And um, it's been in several situations a sanctuary city where people go for safety. And a lot of people came to Duhok for that. Um, a lot of people came to Duhok, including my guide, who I'm going to introduce in a few slides, are fleeing ISIS or Daesh. And uh, places like Sinjar, of course, are not, not too far away, so this is one place that they came to. And walking around and just talking to random people in the street, I met people, for example, who had escaped there and they're refugees from Syria, etc. So I sort of feel you know you've got the right country when you can sort of walk around and you're happy just to be somewhere and you're not doing anything in particular. So for the first day, I pretty just much walked around the city a bit and just had a look and sort of was in the place, as it were. So I don't have any sort of fancy photographs my first day or anything like that. Uh, pretty much what you see is just a normal Middle Eastern city and I was just walking around it. Um, I actually follow a vegan diet and I didn't do my planning beforehand. So I went around and discovered what I could eat, which turned out to be falafel sandwiches. Falafel sandwiches are wrapping bread, a very, very stretchy wrapping bread. I'd love to know the recipe, but I don't know. Uh, falafel and vegetables usually including some sort of pickles. So that became my staple diet and some days I actually ate that for morning, lunch and dinner, uh, but it managed to keep me alive. I ate some things at other times as well. One of the other things that was surprisingly very available were Pringles. So almost no other British products that I saw in the shops, except pretty much every shop had Pringles. So that became another thing that I could eat. That's out the window of my hotel. This is me just walking around. I will apologize, I didn't know I was going to do travel talks and things when I came back and I was trying to travel extremely light. So what I did is I um, took as little as possible. So the only camera I had was my very cheap phone, which has not got a good camera. That mountain actually has a Kurdish flag on it. And unfortunately it doesn't show in the photograph because of the lack of contrast. So somewhere on that mountain there is, or well, that hill, there is a Kurdish flag and as you can see, I'm not trying to pick the beauty spots and everything. I was just walking around, just walking around, sort of seeing how things worked, as it were. Um, this again is walking around the town. The two photographs to the right, they show sort of quite a brown tint. And part of that will probably be my camera, not getting the white balance right, but it did actually look very, very brown. It was winter when I was there, but as you can see from the sky, the weather was very, very good. It's a bit colder than it probably looks because it looks quite summery, but it wasn't. But Certainly looking out over the town, it did have this very, very sort of brown look that I've seen quite a lot in Middle Eastern cities. And some of it is dust in the air and some of it is just if you look at it, the materials and colours of the buildings. Uh, the roads are very, very crowded, but getting across them was quite easy after you've done Tehran. Uh, anyone who's been to Tehran will know what that means. <laughs> so fundamentally, you just sort of, uh, there's no real crossings most of the time. You just sort of walk through the traffic. The traffic doesn't stop, so as you can see in the photograph here, you just sort of walk through the cars and the car drivers know what to do and after a while you know what to do. And you just sort of walk through judging whether you're going to go ahead or behind that car and get across. Um, the next day on the 17th was actually my biggest sort of trip around. I met my guide, my hotel arranged my guide for me, and his name was um, <laughs> Khalid, Khalid I Ahmed. And he was actually, I noticed that his email address was actually Sinjar at a well-known email address place. And he came from Sinjar and on the way to the places we were going to, uh, he told me a lot of his story as well, which I found very, very interesting, but not necessarily all happy. He's actually is or was, I'm happy to say, 
an internally displaced person who came to Duhok escaping ISIS. And the car he had wasn't particularly good. It kept breaking down a little bit occasionally. He had to stop the engine and start it up again when the uh, possibly the carburetor or fuel injection wasn't working properly. And he had a better car, but unfortunately he had to abandon the better car, fleeing ISIS when it ran out of petrol. He had to get out and walk. And he believes that ISIS actually got his car. So that was actually the escape from Sinjar, which is actually shown in the film The Besieged Mountain, which I'm going to recommend later on. And um, he was he, he's telling me that he's a Muslim, but he has very, very strong opinions, which pretty much match mine, on ISIS slash Daesh. And that's one thing which, even though I went to no regions that had been uh, occupied by Daesh on my trips, uh, my trip, um, this is one thing, of course, that came out in conversation quite a bit. So this is actually Duhok Reservoir. They quite like the reservoir, their lakes and their waterfalls. So it seems to be a very a cultural thing there that people like watery things. And possibly because a lot of the country is, of course, quite dry, maybe they have a different relationship to water than we do. But this is Duhok Dam. There's a dam there, a reservoir for water. And it's, my photographs aren't best, but it is quite a picturesque place. So we went there first. Um, I'll show you the trip I actually went on, and as you see, it's all in the Kurdish region at the top. Uh, effectively, I started off in Duhok, and the next day, the day I'm talking about now, we went to um, Lalish, Amedi, and Alkosh. And after that, I went to the, effectively the capital, the capital of the Iraq Kurdish federal region, Erbil, then on to Suleimania, then on to Said Sadiq, and then on to Halabja, right next to the Iranian border. I then actually doubled back because I left my plane, and my plane left from Erbil. So I went from west to east, effectively, and then back all the way back to Erbil, which is quite easy to travel, and then out again. I'm watching the time and the number of slides I have, so I have to keep on going. This is just on the road, and Kurdistan has a very, very sort of, I'd put it unique in my experience, geology. It's a very, very hilly. It's a lot of it seems to be sedimentary rock. I'm sure there are other places in the world which have similar geology, but not ones that I've actually visited. So I took a lot of photographs just of the general geology. I have ones of just rocks, huge rocks standing beside the road, etc. Then I went to Ahmadiyya. Uh, how we got to Ahmadiyya was actually a story in itself. It's a very, very fascinating place to go to. And that top photograph, the aerial photograph and the bottom one are both from Wikipedia. Uh, I didn't take those myself, but it looks absolutely fascinating. When I saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to go there. But it's very, very close to the Turkish border. And the Turkish military have actually been bombing regions close to here. So I decided that because of that, uh, for safety reasons, I wouldn't actually go. But when I went up with my guide, he said to me, the three places you want to go to were Lalish, Amadiya, and Alkosh. And I said, I sort of recognized the names and I didn't go and check my emails or anything. I said, yes. So I thought, well, I recognize the names. They must be the right ones, but they weren't actually. So even though I originally planned not to go to Ahmadiyya, um, we did. <laughs> By the time I worked out what was happening, I decided it was far too late to say anything and ask for it to be changed. So we went there and it is actually a fascinating place. And I now look, it's one of those photographs where you look at that and think, oh my gosh, I've been there. Um, as we went there, he pointed out some brand new areas of tarmac on the road. See this big patch of tarmac there? That's where the Turkish military actually bombed the road. And then we drove over it. Um, the place itself is fascinating. That's actually my guide, uh, Mr. Khalid, on the left and just in front of the old entrance. That was the old entrance to the town. They do have sort of like a killjoy, how would you put it, a killjoy uh, modern road up the other side, which you can't quite see from the aerial photographs. So we just sort of drove up it and parked the car at the top. But this is sort of like the old entrance. And when we were there, there were people, uh, old men I noticed, um, carrying large sacks of goods up the old path up into the town. And over the right, we had the town itself. The town, again, like anywhere in Kurdistan, is historical. It was certainly an Assyrian town between the 25th and the 21st centuries. Uh, it was founded in between the 25th and the 21st centuries. BC as an Assyrian town and probably they say that it probably was inhabited before then because of its very convenient location right on top of a hill and this is me walking a little bit down the path but not too far down because I then have to walk back up again and um, it'd be interesting sort of living in houses that sort of edge onto the edge right like that. Uh, it's got a lot of history the uh, Badanan Emirate was a Muslim Kurdish Emirate which was it says here from the 11th century, but Wikipedia actually says 
um, longer. Okay. Okay, good. Five minutes. So we're way behind on slides. We'll have to go through quite quickly. Uh, it's got a lot of history and that's one of the parts of the history. We went then to Lalish and Lalish was one of the places I definitely wanted to go to. It's the main temple town of the Yazidi faith and is always mentioned by them. So if you see pictures of uh, representing the Yazidi religion, it will always be, um, what's the word? It will always be the Lalish that they show. It was quite interesting because um, I'm going to recommend later on a little video where people actually sang a song for the promoting the Kurdish referendum and they filmed it there, so I went to the same place. Just notice that I'm barefoot. Uh, it's traditional to approach the temple in barefoot. They say that if you really can't, they, they, they don't mind, but um, I wanted to do it. I was really, really worried because it was December that it would all be snow and ice and therefore I wouldn't be able to do it. But it was cold, but it was okay. And that's Mr. Khaled outside the temple. And that's an overview view of the temple. I didn't actually get up that high myself. That's another picture from Wikipedia. So watching the minutes counting down, I wanted to get at least through Alkosh. Alkosh is a Christian town. Um, this is a photograph that I took from outside of the town where we were stopped. There are quite a lot of checkpoints in Kurdistan where they stop you and check your passport and ask you where you're going. Uh, these are typically militia people, which are usually carrying AK-47s. So I say to people, you rapidly got used to AK-47s all over the place. Uh, this is outside the town. We're actually going to a monastery inside the town and it's a Christian town. So if you actually could step back a little bit, you'd see a gate with a big cross over the top. And this again is historically an Assyrian town, although the current population is mostly Assyrian Christian, but also mixed. Uh, this is a town, this is a house, which is just a private house, which is owned by an artist. And my guy took me here, we parked here and showed me the house. I hope the person who lives inside the house is okay with me taking the photographs. This is actually the monastery. You sometimes have to look at it. It's one of those things, can you quite see it? It's up on the hill. Um, it was established in 640 AD by the monk uh, Homizid. I haven't pronounced his name right. And again, it's a fascinating place. They started it off by sort of burrowing into the hill. So it's all caves dug into the hill with the slightly more modern uh, outside. This town, if we actually go back to this slide, uh, not that slide, but the previous slide, this is actually the Mosul Plain. So between these hills and the hills, which you see if we turned around, is the Mosul Plain. And uh, Daesh actually got as far as the hills on the other side. They attempted to capture this town, but they were repulsed by a combination of the Peshmerga and Assyrian militia and local townspeople who fought ISIS and stopped them and, prevent and protected their town. And of course, this monastery would actually have been a target for ISIS and they did destroy other monasteries where they actually captured them. So the fact that I'm able to see it and it's still in good condition is thanks to the people who defended that town. This is the outside of the monastery and it looks quite modern there, but if you go inside, it actually looks start quite different. Okay, I'm not quite sure exactly how many minutes I've got left, about two or three. So that's the inside of the monastery. We actually saw people there. There were local people there, young people who have sort of gone out for a day trip, I assume. But unlike Iran, I think people in Kurdistan, they don't... Okay. <laughs> um, I think I've got through to enough slides, so we can stop there. But I was just going to say that um, the local people, they did tend to be a little bit standoffish. They wouldn't sort of speak to you a lot of the time, but there's good, strong reason for that. And they do tend to be a bit worried about outsiders due to their history and what has been done. So once you get to speak to people, it's all fine. But compared to Iran, fewer people would just come up to, the come up to you in the street and talk. Some people would, some people would, some people did, but not quite so many. So this is actually, uh, my guide Khaled was very proud to show me Mosul Dam, which is the big reservoir where there has been some concerns about the structure of the dam. And this is also the closest I got to Mosul, which was about 25 kilometers away. And to go any closer, my visa did not allow it. And um, I didn't want to do what some other people online have done, which is get there illegally. <laughs> um, after that, I went to Erbil. And this was the map of Iraq, according to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, at the time when I left. And you can see it's advised against all but essential travel for most of the area. But I also then took a taxi, which went, went straight from there to there. So this is in the red zone. So if you're wondering what happens in these zones where you advise against all travel, then you get something which looks quite peaceful like this. We stopped, we had tea. Um, I went to a shop and what surprised me was that they had just tables set out with products on them. And one table was completely covered in a big pyramid of Pringles. So I bought <laughs> Pringles there. 
and I also visited the customer toilet and I said as a joke that after visiting the customer toilet I now know why the Foreign and Commonwealth Office advise against all travel to that area. We then got to Erbil which is actually listed as one of the five most safe, safe, safest uh, cities in the world oh. and I did put on Facebook at that time that anyone who's not in one of these cities and I mentioned four cities in Canada and Japan etc if you're not in one of those cities then please get to a safer place immediately. Uh, that's the Citadel and that citadel is on top of a hill, but that is what's called a tell, where fundamentally over 6,000 years of continuous occupation, the later oh. towns have been built on top of the earlier towns, and it slowly builds up and up and up and up. Oh. And if anybody saw the episode of Doctor Who, which was in Aleppo, when I saw the preview of that, I thought it was going to be the citadel in Erbil, but it turned out to be Aleppo, which is a similar looking place. Uh, this is the area in front of there, sort of like the main town square, maybe. And as you can see, there are Kurdish flags everywhere. As I mentioned, there's a very strong national identity um, among Kurdish people, even though they don't, unfortunately, have their own country or nation. Up in the Citadel, I'm taking photographs of things that maybe tourists shouldn't be. It was a lot of rebuilding going on, and I couldn't get as far around the citadel and see the area on top as other people have in the past because they're doing a lot of rebuilding and enhancement work so as you can see we can't go forward. Uh, a lot of that work actually stopped while they were concentrating on fighting ISIS and it's now restarted again that ISIS have been defeated on the ground and um, therefore there's a lot of places I couldn't get to and I went through roads that are being rebuilt and we had to take a sidetrack over some dirt etc and all sorts of things happened like that. The Citadel has a lot of very small museums and there's two of them I took photographs of. This is the Kurdish Music Museum. It shows a lot of the equipment used and also a lot of the tapes and I bought some CDs there. And this is the biggest museum of the ones I saw, which is the Textile Museum, which is all about Kurdish uh, textiles and how they're made, etc. Uh, then there's a big jump here. I went by shared taxi all the way to Slimani. Uh, a lot of the towns have two pronunciation, both the Arabic pronunciation and the Kurdish pronunciation. Uh, in the shared taxi, I was told that in Iran, if you get into shared taxi, you get big, long political discussions. But it didn't actually happen that much, but it certainly was happening, happening in Kurdistan. And we had five of us in the taxi, which came from a place called Koya. And in there, there was certainly a big, long discussion because I could hear the occasional words such as Saddam, Saddam, Harain, Iran, um, uh, Kurdi, yeah, Arab, yeah, and etc., and all sorts of words that I slightly recognized. I knew they were talking politics, but I didn't know what it was about. At the end of it, because I was using the words Sulaymaniyah, through the considerable uh, language barrier, they told me that I should be calling it Slemani because that's the Kurdish name and it sounds more Kurdish if I say it. Unfortunately, the Kurdish name for Erbil is something like Horla, but I can't pronounce it. It's got this H that I can't do. Uh, that's the Amna Saraka Museum. Now I did say that my trip was not meant to be dark tourism, but there are some places where you go where it is certainly displaying and talking about what has happened in the past. And somebody online that I saw when I did a bit of background research for this talk described this as the world's most depressing museum. It's basically a prison. Most of it's a prison left pretty much as it was from Saddam Hussein's era, where an awful lot of people were tortured and a lot of people were killed. And if you see those little LED lights on the top, which are then reflected in the mirrors, each one of those is meant to represent one person who died at the prison. So it's not, I would describe, a, a, say, a very happy place. But I do think it's important that we remember these things so that they're less likely to happen again and we're more likely to recognise if things are going bad again, as I think is entirely possible. That's also from the prison. Um, I want to point out Dolphin Hotel and Hostel and Shah down the corner. So the person who's most down the corner is Shah, who runs the Dolphin Hotel in Slimani. And he's done an awful lot of work, particularly online, to welcome tourists to Kurdistan and to make it easy for them to come, etc. There's one of his uh, Facebook groups, Backpacking Iraqi Kurdistan. He just made a brand new one called See You in Iraqi Kurdistan as well. And uh, he befriended me on Facebook and he was writing a lot of comments in there. Uh, that's me actually in his hotel. So I got a picture of my feet there saying I'm putting my feet up today and relaxing in the Dolphin Hotel. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was amused by that. Um, this is actually I, in Slamani. I spent some time just sort of walking around, just being sort of normal again, because I was getting a bit tired 
of tired in a good way in terms of physical exhaustion of doing sort of um, effectively tourism every day. So I took a day off and as part of that day I went to the swimming pool. Uh, it was quite interesting because on the way there someone suddenly saw me in the street and they came up and spoke to me. They didn't speak much English, they kept asking if they spoke German. He was a Kurdish person who spent most of his life in Germany and he kept saying to me, you don't need to be scared, you don't need to be frightened, no one's going to hurt you. And he seemed to think that because I was a Westerner in Somali that I would therefore be terrified. And I was sort of saying, um, okay. <laughs> and I said, he said, do you want me to take you to the swimming pool? And I said, um, it's okay, I can go, but if you want to come, we can talk, you're fine. So he took me to the swimming pool and um, he kept saying, you know, he said things like um, in Slomani, which is a city of about 600 something thousand people, I think, probably Europeans only you, <laughs> he said, and things like that. The pool was very good. It's a nice pool, spent some time swimming up and down, and of course they have a jacuzzi over the side, and I ended up in the jacuzzi of a whole lot of other people. I will point out though that the pool was gender segregated, which um, obviously it's a different culture. Um, a whole lot of people in the pool are having a big discussion through the language barrier as best we could. Um, these are actually my friends Tracy and Kev, and they went to Somani and they found this shop. And I was pointing out that while I got quite used to seeing AK-47s etc around, all of the guns I saw except for one, which I actually sat on in a taxi. I sat down in a taxi and there's something hard underneath me. I pulled it out and it was a hand, which I then gave to the driver, not knowing what else to do with it. Um, but uh, Tracy and Kev, they found this shop, which is obviously something that I never saw. So <laughs> I didn't get to see everything. This is Said Sadiq, where I met up with my friend Koshis, who I hope has really able to rejoin and should be there. And this is the mountain that's pretty much sort of above his house. If you come down off the mountain, come back a couple of streets, that's his house where we stayed overnight. So he's very generous, he invited me in and they discovered that I was a vegan and I don't like to cause people trouble. So we had a bit of a discussion, but um, they said they're a little bit sad. They wish they could, I could eat meat so they could actually have made more for me, but they made this fascinating uh, Kurdish vegan lunch. I posted this on a vegan travel group on Facebook and it got about 500 likes. So it was oh. extremely popular and it was a very, very nice meal. Some of which I've been able to duplicate now that I'm back here. We went down to the monument at Halabja and this um, is a monument for the people who lost their lives in a chemical attack by Saddam Hussein on the city of Halabja. And it's something that I wanted to see. As I said, I didn't want my trip to be sort of dark tourism, concentrating on the darker side of things, but there are certain things where I wanted to sort of go there and hopefully be able to pay my respects, which I hope I was able to do. I left a message in the uh, guest book, etc. The people were um, quite keen that I do. Um, as I said, people are very, very keen that people know about the things that have happened and things like chemical weapons and chemical warfare is something that we still need to think about. And remembering the people who have died in the past will hopefully focus us on trying to prevent that happening in the future. Uh, this is me and Koshius, who I hope has actually joined. And in front of there, there's my blue shoes. I decided I was going to have one pair of brand new shoes so I was packing as light as possible. And that was the only pair I had for the entire trip. But fortunately, since they were brand new and I had uh, odor eater insoles in them, they seemed to last the trip without becoming unusable. Uh, when we actually visited the monument, there was a sign up saying guns are not allowed. And we were actually asked if we had any guns, which we didn't. So we were allowed through. Uh, this is actually uh, in the car with uh, Koshis and his brother Baham. And this is actually as close as I plan to get to the Iranian border. So those hills are basically the Iranian border. It's about nine kilometers away. And that was my plan that I'd be able to see those hills and say I went that close to the Iranian border. I wouldn't mind being on this side of the Iranian border or on the other side of the Iranian border in Iran. I wouldn't mind going through a set up checkpoint, a border checkpoint between the two countries. But I do not want to be near the border in places where I somebody might think that I shouldn't be. It's quite close to here that three Americans were actually arrested for oh. going tramping and they wandered too close to the Iranian border, which is sort of uh, apparently quite undefined. They were arrested and they spent some years in an Iranian prison before oh they were my So I wanted to be a bit careful about that. Those tourists actually went to a waterfall called the Ahmed Awa waterfall. And this stream, this is uh, Koshis and his brother Baham, who have taken me closer than I expected to go to Iran. And I think they're a little bit amused at this point because I was sort of getting slightly reluctant and slightly nervous. The water that you see down below actually has come from the waterfall. The waterfall, this is about four kilometers away from the border. 
and it's two kilometers to the waterfall, another two kilometers to the border. So the American tourists went to the waterfall and then somehow kept on going and got there. Uh, Kosius also introduced me to Muhammad Haji Mahmoud. He's a very, very well-known person. A lot of people have said he's a very good man. He's the leader of the Kurdish Democratic Socialist Party. Uh, this is when I was invited to his home and he actually gave me a copy of one volume of his autobiography, the one with the pictures in it, because I can't actually read the text. So that was very, very kind and an experience I greatly appreciate. This photograph was taken by a professional photograph, photographer who photographed my visit. Uh -huh. This is me. Uh, I haven't given Koshius the chance to talk yet. Um, oh, right. Uh, do I speak languages and always have a translator? No, <laughs> fundamentally, I went around not being able to speak the language and not having a translator. Uh, this eventually turned out to be an advantage because at one of the checkpoints, the soldiers stopped me and they obviously wanted to talk to me about something. But fundamentally, they couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak either Kurdish or Arabic. And so therefore, I just sort of waited until they gave up. And therefore, whatever it is they wanted to talk to me about, they had my passport open. They were pointing in my passport and saying something. I have no idea what it was about. So I just kept, kept on saying, visa, okay. Visa, okay. <laughs> and eventually they let me go. Uh, were women in evidence? I didn't meet many women. And because of what my guide told me on the first day, I was very, very careful not to sort of, you know, go around striking up conversation because it is a very uh, conservative society. And for some people in more conservative families, uh, that could be an issue. Uh, in the Citadel and Erdl, someone just came out of there. And I think there were sort of three generations of women as a group. Uh, mother, daughter and grandmother and the mother just said oh hi to me as they went past and I was sort of so shocked that I just said hi back and didn't say anything um, but it's it's if you go into the shops almost all of the shops sort of it's men behind the shop counter so normally if you go to a country you'd meet a lot of people just in shops for example but in that case it was mostly men mostly men I met uh, in the, one of the taxis coming over I was very disappointed because uh, a couple got on quite an elderly couple and they were speaking very very openly and talking a lot and I'd obviously be able to speak to both of them, both of them quite a lot, except of course they didn't speak English and I didn't speak Kurdish. Mm. So this is the road between uh, Erbil and going back again. My timing's not very good for this talk, I apologise. Um, this is very fascinating and we talked in Koshyas, uh, translated for, for us and um, one of the questions he asked me was that was the same question that Koshyas's father asked me, is um, you know, why, why, don't, why doesn't Kurdistan have its own country? And of course, I have no answer for this. And they sort of say, if you look at the ex-Soviet republics and a whole lot of new countries appeared, we had Sudan, North and South Sudan, and lots of other countries, uh, Czechoslovakia split into the Czech Republic and Slovakian Republic. Uh, I think the names of the countries are now different and etc. And of course, the answer I have is that I don't know. And um, it is difficult because it's a, when I go to a country I want to learn and I want to continue learning when I come back and I've sort of read up the history so I understand the history of how it happened and that it was a very very simple put it, decision made by a Frenchman and an Englishman deciding how people in the rest of the world are going to be divided into countries and I'd hope that in the modern world we'd have the ability to sort of fix these problems but of course it's not so easy because of course uh, Turkey doesn't want to lose a large part of its territory um, and the same for the other four countries. So you get the Kurdish people being split into four different countries and being a minority in each when in actual fact the area is certainly large enough and certainly has national identity. Um, that's something which I saw over and over again while, I'm, while I was there and when I'm back to become its own country and it could also be said to have a more effective government for the local government than, than the countries around it in some ways. So I feel it would be quite a but I have no answer for the question. I, I also thanked um, um, Hakam Mahmoud for his fight against ISIS because I, I've seen the damage that ISIS have done. And while of course many, all of us are sort of aware of it before we went, it's when you actually meet the people who have been displaced, etc., uh, due to these wars and etc., and heard what has happened. And I read Nadia Morad's book. Uh, she was the Yazidi woman who spoke in front of the United Nations. I've read her book and seen what the, um, and it therefore sort of learned of her experience of how things work. And he actually uh, led the Kurdish forces that expelled uh, ISIS from Kirkuk. So I actually, I thanked him for that. And he said to me that um, ISIS defeated on the ground, 
but ISIS are an idea. They're not just an army or a group of people. They're an idea, and you can't defeat ideas. And so there is, you know, that is one of the worries that happens. Some people are more worried than others that uh, in the future that ISIS might come back. Uh, this is me going back. That's actually a red bull in my hand. So it's surprising what they have and what they don't. I think I also bought some Pringles there. And um, this is on the road back to Erbil. This was in a shared taxi. And uh, this is when the two soldiers I mentioned before, they took me out. We go through the checkpoints quite often. There are armed soldiers there. And they sometimes want to interview you. But of course, the problem is that there's a language barrier. And usually, I think they expect people to be traveling with the translator. Um, or at least some sort of guide, and I, I completely wasn't. I turned up to the taxi by myself. <coughs> I I found I had to go to Baghdad Garage in Slimani to get a taxi to Erbil. And then when I got there, I just said, Erbil, Erbil. <laughs> and then they said, this pointed this way, pointed this way. I just made the sort of the universal hand gesture of money, how much, and they sort of hand gestured 15,000. I gave it to them, and then we went off to Erbil. And the third taxis, I think, are an experience. Compared to Iran, I think the taxi driving, on average, is better in Kurdistan. So when I got into the first taxi and I had no seatbelt in the back, was a little bit concerned. But apart from one taxi driver, actually this journey that you see here, who was quite uh, aggressive about overtaking and staying on the wrong side of the road a very long time, um, generally the driving was actually not too bad. Uh, this is Christmas Eve. And I see that uh, timing is turning out a bit better this time because some of my last slides just click flash over ones. Uh, this is the last night I was there. So this is effectively probably Christmas Eve, but probably very, very early in the morning in Christmas Eve because it's when I got up at midnight to go out and catch my 3 a.m. plane. And this is back in Erbil. And all the Christmas decorations are up and all the lights are up and they'd actually turn the fountains on. But unfortunately, I don't have a phone which is able to take photographs in a situation like this. Um, when I was actually back in my hotel, somebody lit off fireworks. And uh, even though, you know, I was sort of thoroughly used to being in the country by then, when I heard the bang, bang, bang of the fireworks being set off, I initially thought, oh dear, what's that? And then, of course, you hear the sort of the sound of fireworks exploding in the sky and you recognize that, so you know what it is. But until between the time when, um, between the time when I heard the bangs and when I actually heard the firework bits, possibly some of my muscles were slightly clenched. Um, I was quite amused that I got there and originally I wasn't going to have a hotel, I was just going to sort of walk around until midnight and then uh, take a taxi to the airport, but I decided that I would actually get a hotel, so I walked around the Citadel and found the first hotel that would have me, and it is certainly in terms of cleanliness and facilities the worst hotel I've ever been in my life. Um, it was, they were all sort of about the same price, it was $20, $20 American dollars for the night. Um, there were wires coming out near the power socket which I stayed well away from etc and you can see what the glass looks like but the people who universally as with the other hotels the people who ran it were very nice people they're very helpful so in actual fact I think that if I go back I would actually like to go back and stay there but maybe only one night um, and as part of that the toilet was the most primitive toilet I've ever seen except for one in a tiny village in Iran in terms of Middle Eastern toilets I mean and this is an after bear. This is the toilet pitcher, is the English way of describing it. And you fill it full of water and it's used for one purpose usually, which is washing yourself. And this, in this case, there was actually no flush for the toilet, so that you then had to use the after bear to flush the toilet as well. I put it there because I've been joking about the after bear a lot recently because people were getting concerned about lack of toilet paper. And I'm saying, as somebody who's traveled in the Middle East, this supposed lack of toilet paper has no fear for me because I know what to do. Um, what no waterfalls? Uh, waterfalls are very, very popular in Kurdistan, and I actually didn't visit any of them. And I don't sort of mind that in a way, because you can't do everything, but probably some people would be quite surprised. So this is one of their famous waterfalls, and you see them in the summer, and there's just masses of people all around. And you get people who are tourists, and they hold up the, one of the Iraqi notes, and it's got a picture of the same waterfall on it, etc. Recommended media. If you want to look see a little bit more of the areas I went to, I recommend this song because the video clip for this song uh, basically shows most of the places I've visited. <laughs> Duhok, uh, Halabja Monument, uh, Erbil, Sulaymaniyah, etc., Lalish, etc. So that's one I recommend. It's easily found on, on YouTube. 
Um, this is the one which actually made me really think I wanted to go to the Lalish Temple. And if you look there, everybody is barefoot and hopefully they're in summer so their feet weren't cold like mine. Uh, the referendum itself is an interesting thing because it's obviously the result was 90 something percent, very, very high 90 something percent for independence but it was not allowed by the central government. And this actually has led to some bad effects where the central government have actually taken over areas which were previously held by uh, Kurdish people. Uh, this song was promoting the referendum and it was actually filmed outside the Lalish temple. So I went there and made sure that I visited the same place. Uh, this is actually, as I said, the people are very, very keen that people know about what has happened. And this is a film which you can see online, which is a film by Yazda, which is a Yazidi organization about the Yazidi genocide. And if you want to see sort of like what things were like when I was visiting, if you watch about the first seven minutes or so, then you'll see a lot of what it was like for me. But after that, it shows uh, the Daesh occupation of Sinjar and what happened to a lot of the people. And I actually sort of went, I went to the temple. And after that, I read the book by Nadia Murad and I did realize I more of what I sort of, I understood more of what I sort of saw there. When we went in, myself, my guide, Caleb, it was one day I had a guide and the days with Koshi uh, uh, guided me. Uh, one day we went in there and so the day there, we spoke to a very serious young man and the first question he asked was, was I aware of the genocide? And they want to make sure that people know about it. And if you want to see a film, I wouldn't say the production standards are very professional because it's made by people who actually were displaced people and actually suffered at the hand of the vices. So the actors and the producers, etc., are the real people involved in the event or the events. Um, but that's something, again, you can quickly find on YouTube. Uh, Richard Welding, I sort of apologise for my photographs not being beautiful and magnificent. Uh, like a lot of tourist people do, they seem to have very good cameras because I just took my phone and they're very, very good at sort of framing the shot, knowing how to use lighting, etc. So if you want to see some really beautiful photographs of the areas, um, this is a good site to look at. And we talk about the end or is it? Um, I have been thinking about the flights and I mentioned the flights before. And I sat down and decided to design what I could actually do if I wanted to do a trip like this, but I didn't actually fly. So this trip is actually a feasible trip, although this is the shorter version, which assumes that I can get a transit visa for Turkmenistan when I'm told that it's more or less a 50-50 shot whether you do or not. So if I don't get a Turkmenistan visa, then I have to go all the way around the Caspian Sea the other way. But this is all coach, ferry and train journeys, and it's all put together. Um, I can't do what other people will do, such as Debs, for example, from the previous talk, and cycle all the way, because I worked out it would take me 120 days, approximately. And that's actually quite generous, uh, quite uh, optimistic in terms of the daily distances, it assumes that I can get up to the maximum I was able to do before. So it would take me a very, very, very long time, but uh, it's feasible by trains, etc. Um, I've travelled on night trains and, to, and, and around, and they were really, really nice, enjoyable experience. So that's a possibility for the future when the world gets back to a more normal place. And there's a challenge if anybody wants to one-up me, I recommend uh, my Facebook friend Kazal Hussain and uh, he works for Untamed Borders and he guides people in Afghanistan. And again, I have looked into Afghanistan and decided it's not for me because I'm sort of quite a nervous traveller. Um, but people do and uh, if you want to speak to someone who can then guide you there. And I think it's a place where you much, much more need a guide than other countries I've visited, then that's a recommendation. Otherwise, if you just look at the photographs, they're all absolutely beautiful. Uh, because I work at DMU, I want to be careful about crediting um, all the photographs I used that weren't mine, so these are them. Uh, this will be going up on YouTube, and I'm going to hand back to Tricia now. And um, hi, one thing I forgot to say in the talk, which um, hopefully will be inserted, is that um, Muhammad Haji Mahmood, um, I was interested that when I was told we were going to go visit him, I actually read his Wikipedia page and it said that he's the um, reputed to be the person who fired the first shot in the Kurdish uh, revolt against Saddam Hussein. And that of course that sort of error is covered in the uh, book, his um, life story, which he gave to me and there are plenty of photographs of that era in there.